Welcome into the Atlanta Inquirer podcast and happy holidays, everybody. Hopefully it was happy, healthy one uh, for all of you out there. And joining us now is Mike Latulip, our Atlanta basketball analyst here at Atlanta Inquirer. And uh, Mike, it's been a happier uh, holiday here as Illinois finally gets a win in the bragging rights and just a convincing one. I mean, 25 points, 88-63 uh, is actually uh, doesn't look as good for Illinois as it was for most of this game. Uh, but man, I mean, that, that was a convincing win. It's, a, it's not a good Missouri team. You wonder about the future of Conzo Martin there, uh, even though Brad Underwood has struggled in this. Obviously, Illinois has taken way more strides with, with the, the, those two programs over the last five years. So just your overall thoughts on a, just a, a convincing Illini route. Yeah, I think typically in this game, you, you tend to see it played a little bit closer, no matter, no matter what the records are. And especially in my experience there in four games that I was in, we played, you know, we played some pretty, some pretty close games, but you know, I, the, the whole Mizzou's not a good team, you know, they aren't a good team. So that's what you do against not so good teams. You know, you run them out of the gym and that's exactly what they did. And in terms of how they did it, um, I thought they set the tone from a physicality standpoint. There's, there's just no question who set the tone and, and, and 22 seconds into the game, it was pretty evident. Jay Granison running down the court, turns back around, sets a little screen in the backcourt and basically uh, a back-breaking screen. And, and those are, and Coleman Hawkins did it in the first half as well. Those type of just heady, that's not a, that's not a setup play. That's not, Trent Frazier didn't call for it. That's just Jacob Grandison, Coleman Hawkins going out and making physical plays. And I thought that ended up being the story. I thought, you know, on the glass, setting up cuts, screens, uh, the activity in the gaps, it just, it, it was a full 40 minutes, which I think for the most part is what's been kind of their, I guess their Achilles heel at times is putting together 32 really good minutes. And I thought despite Mizzou going on a little bit of a run, um, I thought they put together a pretty complete performance and, and just pretty much overwhelmed Mizzou on the defensive end. And then once you add a three point barrage on top of it, it's, it's, it's hard to stop that avalanche. Yeah, I want to bring this up, Mike, because the last eight games, we've talked about good offensively this team has turned into, and the last eight games statistics are ridiculous. Last eight games, 86.8 points per game, 58% from the field, 12.5 three-pointers made per game at a 44.4% clip. Um, now, it's going to get tougher during Big Ten play, right? There, there's better athletes or better teams. Uh, usually the Big Ten's pretty good defensively. But we saw them succeed against Arizona. We've seen them succeed against Missouri, which kind of prides itself on being tough defensively. So is, is this – how legit is this offense, which I, I'm guessing over that eight-game stretch, I don't have the numbers, is the number one offense in the country. Yeah. Right now in Kempom, it's number 10 uh, for the season. I, I think this is much closer to who they actually are. It, if it's going to be at this clip, like it has been this last eight games, doubtful. Uh, but I still think the pieces that, that make it all up and the way it works together, we'll show it in the film breakdown here, but and we, we've showed it countless times what Kofi creates for these outside shooters. And now the way that Alfonso Plummer has been playing, and you saw Mizzou do it, and these teams are starting to do it a little bit, and Brad Underwood starting to put him in ball screen situations, which is awesome because if he can handle it, they're hard hedging him um, in certain situations, and they're trapping him in certain situations. So now not only do you have a big – getting pulled away from the basket while Kofi rolls. Now you have so many guys freed up on the backside for open shots because the help typically will come out of the paint for those rotations, but they don't want to leave the paint because Kofi Coburn's down there. So either you have a wide open three, or if they do leave the paint, now you're going to have a guard rotating over that's going to have to hold the fort down with Kofi down there while the big that was hedging returns. So I've, I've noticed just really, really smart stuff from the Illinois staff of, hey, let's put Alfonso Plummer in some ball screen situations. If they want to drop, go into drop coverage, he's going to have a pull-up. He's going to have pull-up three, pull-up two. He can get downhill. He can attack a big. But also, if they're, going to, if they're going to trap, he's shown that he can throw out of it. He had the, you know, the I guess the play that I'm referring to in the first half, he got trapped. Kofi rolled. They stayed home, and he just threw a, a little hook pass to, out of the trap to Jacob Grandison for, you know, Jacob Grandison, the 50% three-point shooter, um, you know, wide open for three. So I think they've found different ways to utilize their personnel. And I think that's a lot of credit to this coaching staff 
and, and how they've been able to, to do that without making Alfonso Palmer ball dominant, right? Mm-hmm. And, and not really taking away from what he's good at. So I, I thought that's been fantastic. But you talk about the rate at which they're doing this. I mean, Brad Underwood touched on it before the season, just how talented this team was offensively how well they could shoot the ball, how Alfonso Plummer is the best shooter he's ever coached. I think that's pretty much <laughs> proven to be true at this point. Um, but, you know, you go back through and you see how these teams shoot the ball. I mean, go back to the last, you know, let's go back to 2015, for example, or maybe let's just go back to the last six final fours. I mean, this team obviously has aspirations of getting to a final four. So how is that done? The teams that have reached the final four, if they have done it, like what have their numbers look like? When you look back, on these past let's say six final fours you know there have been only five teams that have shot below 37 percent from three five teams out of 24 you know and over the last six final fours and when you when you look at those teams that that didn't shoot over 37 percent okay well what, what else were they doing you look back at 2018 michigan right um you think like Duncan Robinson was at that team on that team. They actually shot below 37% from three, but they were the number three defense in the country. And they were number four in terms of taking care of the ball, right? You keep going down the list, Carolina, North Carolina won the national championship in 2017. They shot, I think 35% from three, but they were the number one offensive rebounding team in the country. And they actually had the number one offensive efficiency in the country because they were just so dominant. Kennedy Meeks, Bryce Johnson in the post. And then, you know, that same final four, South Carolina was 33% from three, but they were the number three defense in the country. So, you know, you look at these teams and what they've done over the years to achieve those type of things. And Baylor last year, right, wins the national championship, shoots 41% from three. They're the fifth offensive rebounding team in the country. Um, those things tend to really help you out. Um, and when you shoot almost 40% from three and when you're, a top five offensive rebounding team in the country. Those are, yeah, number two now. Those are teams that go far in March. The issue is you look at all these teams that have gone to the final four the last five years, not one of them has been 300 or above in turnover, in turnover percentage. Mm-hmm. So that's where you look at this team and you think how good they are offensively. And they still have so much improvement from a, you know, from a taking care of the ball standpoint. So I think that, that, that's even more reason to, to be optimistic and not just sit here and think, oh, water's going to find its level and they're going to start missing shots. It's just, hey, you know, they may start missing shots, but if they start taking care of the ball better, then those missed shots go right back to the number two offensive rebounding team in the country. So it, it's, it's a tough team to prepare for. It's a tough team to scout for. Um, and they're becoming a really tough team to play night in and night out. Yeah. You mentioned this last week about uh, Alfonso Plummer's last eight games. He's now averaging 22.9 points per game during that. Uh, there's only one player in the country this season that's averaging more than that, and that's Keegan Murray. Then you have Kofi Coburn, who's fifth in the country in scoring at 21.8 points, uh, third in rebounds right now at 12.8. Oscar Shibway is averaging 15.8 or something like that. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Um, and then I just want to mention Jacob Grandison. I, I just had this thought. Um, and obviously Trent Frazier is playing incredibly well right now, shooting really, really well from three over the last, you know, five or six games, but Jacob Grandison shooting 51% from three right now. And I look at his game and I've, I've watched him now for, for the last, you know, tw- 10 games he's played this year. And I'm sitting on, there's some Isaiah livers there. Like I, I I'm sitting there going like, he's a, he's like 85% of Isaiah livers right now. We don't think about him like that because livers was this great player for Michigan and Grandison kind of played the small role. Um, but it's been amazing what the, the kind of jump he's taken and maybe we shouldn't be too surprised because he's been a leading scorer for a team on the division one level, but uh, his efficiency is ridiculous. And I think we need to be talking about him more as like, he's going to have a long professional career. And I I, I wrote in my Christmas column, get him a G league contract, see what he can do. <laughs> because if, if you can shoot like that, you got that offensive skill, you might have a chance. And he's already a high IQ guy. And you go and look at that in the zoo game in particular. And there were just so many high IQ plays, big and small. I mean, he's inbounding the ball in the second half. He realizes that Brazil was guarding him and goes and leaves to trap. So he literally tries to get a running start as he's inbounding it and inbounds it and gets it right back and dribbles up the floor and they're able to spray it around and hit a three. And all that stems from just being heady, right? Not just standing there and getting it in. Now Brazil can come off and guard. Like 
he does such a tremendous job of reading the game and just being a basketball player. I mean, you talk about the cut that he made in the first half off the back door. Hawkins hits him. He dumps it off to Kofi. He has just been, you know, and, and I talked about the physicality standpoint. I mean, he, he kept balls alive, you know, against Missouri. He's setting those kind of crackback screens uh, in the backcourt. But his production, I mean, he's nearly 13 a game. And, and I was almost surprised when I saw this. He's not anywhere close to 30 minutes a game. I mean, he's 24 minutes a game, uh, putting up 13 a game, shooting 50% from three, two to one assist to turnover ratio. He, he has really proven to be just completely indispensable. Um, and when you have a guy that can do, I mean, his, his per 40 minutes, his per 40 minute numbers are like 22 a game, like 22 and eight. It's something crazy. But um, he's been such a, a, a key cog for this team. He really has. Uh, and I think... If he can, is he going to shoot at a 51, 52% clip for the rest of the year? I, I'm not sure there's anything to prove right now that he can't do it. I mean, from how he shot it last year and the way that these guys are going to be guarded, uh, which a lot of this focus is going to be on Kofi. And frankly, a lot of focus is going to be on Plummer moving forward as well. Grandison is going to keep being the benefit, the beneficiary of that. So I've been really impressed with him. Uh, he's, he's one of my favorite players to watch here in the recent years, just because he's Johnny on the spot. He, he does the little things and he's willing to, to just do whatever's asked of him. Uh, no matter how big or small his role has to be, it seems, he seems to always make contributions. Mike, I want to ask you about the schedule coming up. And, and obviously there's going to be some concerns here with, with players going home, coming back with all these COVID things. I think we're going to see some disruption here in college basketball, a lot of it. But I do want to ask you about the year that's been 2021 for Illinois basketball as well, because kind of a time of, of, of reflection here. Uh, I did ask Brad uh, about the defense uh, and because obviously the offense is taken huge strides over the last eight games. You think of what, what they were against Cincinnati and, and what they've been the last eight games, but uh, defensively it's not as been as consistent, uh, but you've had some solid performances against some, some not so great offenses. Um, but what, what do you think of where they're at defensively? They're trending up when it comes to some of those defensive metrics. How good do you think this team can be defensively? Because obviously uh, to win the Big Ten, to, to be a you know second weekend team, uh, you're going to have to defend when shots don't go in. And at some point, shots aren't going to go in, I would imagine, uh, for this team. Yeah, you know, look at that Missouri game just in a nutshell. I think if you can bottle that effort, you know, bottle up that effort defensively, the, the focus defensively that they had, uh, that, if that is going to be the team that, and this is the way that they defend moving forward and through the Big Ten slate, I mean, that's, that's a Big Ten championship type level team. Uh, there's no question about it. I think um, those guys were so dialed in. And, and honestly, I, I was so impressed with Alfonso Plummer uh, defensively, and especially in that second half. He had a couple lack of focus plays in the first half, but for the most part in the second half, he's taking two charges. Uh, you know, he's fighting through screens. He's squaring his man back up. Uh, he, he's walling up, as we like to say. Uh, he, he really is a such a key part of this defense because I truly think that their ceiling as a team is going to be predicated on what he does defensively and how, how seriously he takes it. We already know that it just, the offensive end comes so naturally for him, but this team in general, you know, you always want to continue to, to hit that upward trajectory. Right. And like I just mentioned, whether it's offense, whether it's defense, there's still a little bit to be desired there defensively. And I think they're definitely moving in the right direction. The offense, I, I'm not worried about the offense. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure there's anybody that's worried about the offense. Uh, it's shoring up the, the taking care of the ball for sure, which is another step that you can take to help your defense because those turnovers lead to fast break. They lead to open shots. And that's how you can help yourself there. You can help yourself defensively by helping yourself offensively. So um, I think that they're in a position right now with schedule moving forward. It's a pretty favorable schedule. Um, you know, I, I really think that they have a serious chance to be 5-0 and heading into that Michigan game on January 14th. And it's really just going to be the, the attention to detail and the focus on the defensive end. But as we all know, it's the attention to detail and focus outside of those gym doors because all these teams are getting hit hard with COVID pauses and, and what that does for your rhythm as a team, especially a team that's clicking on all cylinders right now offensively and, and getting there defensively. The last thing you want is to all of a sudden go on pause and um, correct me if I'm wrong. Have they, have they made a decision yet on the forfeit 
policy at all? I, they haven't yet. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I would expect a, a lot of teams here uh, after going home for Christmas. Uh, you know, the AP poll is going to come out soon, and I don't expect anyone to jump because there just haven't been many games, haven't been many teams that have lost in front of them. Um, but I, I would expect with, with the numbers we're getting across the country, and, you know, it seems like everybody – we, we know more people that are positive now with COVID than we ever have during this entire thing. I would imagine uh, that'll be the case uh, with most of these basketball programs, but yeah, the big 10 hasn't announced it. I, I think they're probably going to change it here, Mike, I, I would imagine because there's going to be too many teams uh, that, that probably have a bunch of players testing positive here coming back. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, you look at the, the spikes after Thanksgiving, right? This is really when it all started to ramp up. You know, and now Christmas is even is even crazier because I'm looking at this Illinois team in particular. They all stayed here. They all stayed in Champaign for Thanksgiving. You know, they had Thanksgiving dinner together, and I'm pretty sure some of them flew home. Um, and you know, for a couple of days. So I, you know, I I think <laughs> it's almost a timing aspect. It's almost like you want to just get it get knock it out yeah. early. I, I don't know. I mean, I it's oh, you, you're you don't right. want it in March. I, I it's well, it's Brad Underwood kept saying last year the team who avoids COVID is the team that's going to win. Now it's like the team that gets it out of the way earlier. And I, I imagine most of these teams get it out of the way now, like that'll be the, that'll be the factor here. Cause you'd start, certainly don't, don't want it then. I mean, NBA teams are going through this now. You'd rather have it be, beginning of the season, you know, have those antibodies, all that, and, and probably not get it is the wave, you know, lessons here. So um, if there is a time that, you know, and think about this a year ago, I feel better about it because all oh, these players are vaccinated. And this shouldn't have, you know, b- terrible symptoms here. Um, now is the time probably to, to kind of get this out of the way instead of March when you might have to go to an NCAA tournament or a Big Ten tournament with eight players and, and some of your starters out there. Yeah, yeah. And, you, and like you said, you're seeing it across the board. So it's a weird I'm time, man. It's a weird I, time. I'm interested to see how they how these teams – I'm not even sure combat is the right word because it's – you know, it just seems to be hitting anybody, whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, just obviously it's in different ways, but um, yeah, they did a fantastic job of it last year. Uh, I thought they kind of, you know, were a model of consistency in terms of making sure they weren't positive and doing the right things. And I think that that's part of the reason they, they were able to take home a big 10 tournament title um, because of that, dil- that diligence. So same type of thing this year, I know it's different, you know, now that people are vaccinated a little bit more, I think it's, I think people think they can step outside a little bit more and do more things. So, you know, just trying to, to weigh, Hey, how much does this mean to us? Mm-hmm. Right. And, and there'll be plenty of time after the season to go and do certain things, but right now it's just focusing on the task at hand. And um, I'm confident that those guys in the locker room are going to do that. Well, like I said, Mike, uh, we'll have it in minutes here. We're recording this. It's like 11 AM uh, on Monday. Um, I, I don't think Illinois is going to be ranked this week, even though, I think they are a top 25 team, right? Like you have to weigh in the losses to Marquette and Cincinnati, which still aren't great losses, right? Even no matter who you had uh, or or when it happened, but this, this team's playing like a top 25 team. This team's playing like a big 10 title contender. I mean, outside of Purdue, I don't know who people would have above them. Maybe Ohio state, Ohio state's been really good. Speaking of a team on a COVID pause, um, Ohio state's really good. Michigan state's really good. But Illinois certainly is, is starting to look like the team we all thought in the preseason. Yeah, and, and this is always the interesting part with the AP Top 25 is we, we just completely dig into the schedule, right? Who have they beaten? Oh, they beat this team. This team's not any good. Or they lost to this team. Or if you just watch, like, I mean, if you just literally watch this Illinois team over the last, I mean, you're just going back to that Kansas State game and on, really. Uh, it's really hard to watch that team and not say, Hey, that's, that's a top 25 team. Um, yeah. I'm not going to go as far to say they're a top 10 team because you can't <laughs> like, there's still steps you need to take to get there. And, and, you know, one of those things is just limiting your turnovers, but you're absolutely right. I, I, I think they are a top 25 team, whether or not that's reflected in the polls, who knows? I mean, you see everybody, every, a lot of media people want to put out their own polls. Um, saw Jeff Goodman had Illinois at 25 and, um, but really, I, I really think that this, the it's helped them in a way, mm-hmm. um, being a little bit under the radar. And I think with Curbelo out, you know, people expect a little bit less of this team. And then all of a sudden you watch, you're like, man, there are a lot of really, really good players on this team. 
really, really good players. I mean, you talk about Kofi in general, it's a wide open national player of the year race, wide open. I mean, as I was having, I was having a discussion with a buddy of mine the other day and you sit there and you say, I, who is it? I, I don't know. I mean, you, previous years, it's been, it's been relatively obvious in, in some regard, but you know, Kobe's averaging career highs and points, rebounds, assists. I mean, you, you name it. It's hard not to throw his name in there, but the team in general, you know, this is a team that's going to continue to, uh, to hit their stride going into January. I always say January is the, the year that, or the, the month that separates every team. It's the dog days. Mm-hmm. You know, you're on autopilot, you're starting conference play, practices get a little bit shorter. So how much are you getting out of practice? And that's, I think this January is going to determine a lot for this team moving forward in their trajectory. And, and if that's reinserting Andre Curbelo into the rotation somehow, I mean, I think that's a big thing that you have to look for in terms of how they're able to do that and what that looks like. Um, but that's what makes it all fun, right? You know, it just as a coach, as a player, just trying to fight through those obstacles. And, um, you know, COVID's obviously one of them, like we mentioned, but this team is unquestionably in my eyes, a, a top 25 team Reigns to be seen here. I guess you said in a few minutes, we'll, we'll see if that, if that comes true. Uh, yeah. Right now odds to win the wooden award, Paulo Benchero, Duke, Drew, Timmy Gonzaga, the favorites It's uh, six to one plus 600 EJ Liddell deservingly uh, seven yeah. to one. Okay. I got a Gbaji, probably butchered that name out of Kansas 10 to one Jaden Ivy, Purdue, uh, 12 to one. And I just saw him at number four, I think in ESPN's mock draft, uh, Shibwe, uh, 16 to one Kofi Coburn, 18 to one. I think that rises the more we get in the big 10 play. If, if Illinois wins the big 10 or is number two in the big 10, they're a top 15, top 10 team by the end of the year. And Kofi's still averaging 20 and 10. He's going to be a first team all American and he's going to be in the, in the mix for that, uh, for that. That's for sure. Um, all right, Mike, before we get out of here, 2021, Think about what this year was for Illinois basketball. I know it, it ends in the NCAA tournament, disappointingly. I know uh, the season that didn't start well at two and two, but this is one of the best teams in the country over the last year. They went on that ridiculous streak last year that really started uh, mid-January. They win, what was it? Uh, Got to remember myself, 15 of 16 before losing to Loyola Chicago. Now they've won seven of eight, have, have beat some really solid teams, especially Iowa. Um, and I think Notre Dame is, is starting to look like a decent team, but obviously this is, this has been a huge turnaround year, uh, for Illinois basketball. Just what is 2021 meant for this program? Well, this year in particular has been a complete gut check year. You know, you lose IO, you got injuries, you got suspensions. And I think it, it really has shown where this program is at, uh, the character of those guys in the locker room, how unconditional they are. Um, you know, but as, as a program in general, we talked about it before, you know, how do you measure a great season, right? Is it where you finish in the NCAA tournament? Is it, you know, is it conference play? Is it the big 10 tournament? I mean, what is it? And I, and I always go back to growth. Did you grow? You know, did you, did you, did you grow throughout the season as a team? And it has your program grown. And, and I think there's absolutely no question that this Illinois program has done that over the years. And, and, and I think they've, they've done it with, in different ways, you know, you, you go back to two years ago, the 2019, 2020 season, and they, they were winning games in the sixties. That was just how they won games. Uh, they weren't a great outside shooting team. So they found ways to adjust. I've, I've always said with Brad Underwood, he's been able to, to make things work with his personnel. Uh, I, I think a lot of coaches are, you know, can be very reluctant. Hey, this is how we play. Doesn't matter who we have on the court. Even if it looks clunky, this is how we played the last 20 years. This is how we're going to play. He's done such a good job of molding the game plan. And credit to the staff, too, the whole entire staff, molding his game plan, molding their offense, their scheme defensively to what his personnel is. And I think that's a sign of a good coach. I think that's a sign of a good program with guys buying into that. Um, and you can see, too, with these players, you know, I look at the freshmen and, and particularly you want to look at body language, right? You know, the freshmen that aren't playing or the guys that aren't playing on the bench, they're the first ones jumping up and clapping. And that's, that's not, it's not like that everywhere. Um, you know, I'm not inside that locker room every day, but there's certain things that you can look at as a spectator and, and be really proud of. And, and it's, it's this team's um, fight. It's the way that they've grown over the years. I mean, it's not like he inherited uh, you know, just an unbelievable team. It's not like a Ryan Day situation 
where you come in, you're like, ah, we got a pretty good Ohio State team. He, he's really helped build this thing up. And I think that's been the most impressive part of it is he's done it in, in different ways. And, and the team has been adaptable. But uh, Illinois basketball is in a really good spot right now. And I, and I think nationally starting to become a little bit of a name again. Uh, and I think that's, that's all you want. But you do that through the work that you put in. And, and this, this team, this program, uh, specifically some of these seniors, you talk about Trent, DeMonte, uh, you know, what Jacob Grandison has added to this program, Kofi Coburn, um, Alfonso Plummer in his, in his short stint so far. I mean, each guy has stepped up and made contributions and really put their handprint on, um, on what this program is. So uh, as, a, as an alum, as, as someone who played there for four years, I mean, it's, it's hard not to look at all that and just be, be proud of where they're at right now. Yeah, and I think of the the bad break you did get, um, you know, whether it's the, the coaching staff turnover or the Loyola loss and, and that draw for the second round or Adam Miller entering the transfer portal. Um, but you got a third year of Io DeSumo and you made the most of it. it. You get some luck of getting Kofi back and NIL coming in right when that happens. You get the the fortune of the super seniors being able to have a COVID year and Trent Frazier and Demonte Williams. So that there wasn't this dip. Right. And, and that's a kudos also to Brad Underwood, the, the staff he has, I would include Adam Fletcher into that um, because of these guys wanted to come back. They saw upside, um, not only money wise of coming back with NIL, but upside of improving their game. And they wanted to be here still like that's not the case everywhere. So um, they're making the most of that. And, you know, it's, it's amazing. Like some of these players are going to go down as, as some of Illini fans favorite of all time. Uh, and I think Trent has, has reminded people of that this year. Uh, and certainly Alfonso Plummer's so fun to watch, but man, I, I, I think of like who had the best year for an Illini this year and as good as Iowa was like Kofi Coburn, man, it's just um, one of the most impactful people in, in Illinois basketball history, like the, just what he's done uh, for this program and, and, and Underwood and his staff and Orlando Antigua and, and everybody gets credit for developing him, including Adam Fletcher. But uh, he, he's definitely one of the all-time greats. No question. Um, we talk about before, right? Don't get bored with consistency. Uh, and, and that's been – that's really been it with Kofi. You know, he's, he's stepped out, knocked down some 15-footers. You know, he's passing out of the post a little bit, but he's still sticking to who he is. And I think that's, that's what's been so amazing about it. And, and you touched on Io, and I want to make this point – quickly it's 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 one thing for a guy to make a decision to come back for a third year when maybe you know he had some pro prospects and potentially could have gotten drafted you know but to come back and do what he did it's you talk about a recruiting tool right or or not even just recruiting tool now you're talking about keeping your players you know if they if they leave and they're a surefire nba draft pick great but if there's still a little bit of development to have they've proved that they can bring guys back and get to that next step and that's, that's not always the case in, in some programs. Guys can kind of be on that fence of drafted, undrafted, and then come back and kind of just, I don't know, wallow a little bit and, and, and regress depending on who's around them, character of the guys in the locker room, strength coach, all that stuff. And I think he, the way that they run that program is conducive for a guy that maybe wants to come back and get another year of development. And it speaks to the staff, it speaks to these players like I talked about. So um, Kofi's the same thing. Uh, same exact thing, guy coming back and showing that yeah, there is no harm in coming back. You know, if you, if it's a situation you're familiar with, if you've excelled in that situation, um, I think that's all really good, really good things for the kids. Uh, one, but two for this, for the staff and for recruiting tools moving forward is, Hey, whether you stay one, two, three, four, five, Jordan Bohannon, six years, um, we can get the most out of your abilities. And I think that, that that's definitely rang true the last few years. Well, the AP poll came out just before we get out of here, Mike, Illinois one spot outside the AP top 25, which is probably a great thing. For Good. Good. 72 points. I think they had 49 uh, last week. So they're certainly getting more votes, but yeah, I think that's a good carrot in front of this team. They seem to play better uh, as the hunter, not the hunted. Of course they did last year as the hunted and, and did pretty well. Uh, biggest win of the year last year, Mike, it's hard not to go at Michigan, right? Like that Gotta be. without Io and you just absolutely crush uh, the Big Ten title winner. Yeah, yeah. It's it was it was Michigan for sure. And not only just the win, but how they did it. Um, I thought it was a very uniting win. 
not to say that they weren't united before, but I think it, it reaffirmed for everybody where this program was at, regardless of who's in there. Uh, you know, the, the guys that stepped up and uh, that's, that's what's been really impressive. I, I think it's just the guys that have stepped up in different ways when they've been called upon in different moments. You know, it, it helped Iowa. It's helped Kofi. You got to think, I mean, all these guys that have succeeded, you know, Iowa being an All-American, Kofi being an All-American, it's because of their teammates too. Uh, if you don't have good teammates, it's really hard in college basketball to not get completely swarmed, loaded up, up on. It, it's hard. So you need to have good players. And, and Illinois and the this, this staff, and they've done a great job of bringing in guys that, that fit and can let these great players be great because they're byproducts of, you know, of really, really great teammates. Well, Michael Tulip, it's been great to have you now on board this year. It was a good year for us uh, because of that. But uh, hopefully we've got some basketball games to talk about next week. But if not, uh, we'll talk more about what lies ahead with Big Ten play uh, and, and some exciting games coming up. As you said, uh, a nice schedule early on uh, against maybe some bottom half Big Ten teams before you get Michigan and Purdue coming into the State Farm Center. Mike, always appreciate the chats, man. And uh, we'll talk with you on the VIP film room. Absolutely, man. Sounds good.